In the nearest neighbor-like approach, at best you'd have some kind of holdout phase, so to say, where you would say, well, I have maybe 10 different similarity metrics. Let's check on my holdout data which of those 10 similarity metrics does best, and then go with that similarity metric for my test data, right? But you don't have the explicit training on the training data. So what we're going to do in the most of the remainder of this lecture is unify these two approaches into a single approach that does both. Okay? So the trick is called kernelization. So let's revisit the perceptron and then see how from there we can get to effectively a nearest neighbor-like approach. So if we learn a weight vector for the perceptron in multi-class, we'll learn multiple weight vectors, one weight vector WY for each class label Y. Let's check what that vector could look like. So could it be any real vector? No. Why not? The way training works is that when you get something right, it doesn't change. When you get something wrong, you add or subtract the current training example to the vector, right? So your WY will be of this format over here, some addition and subtraction of feature vectors from your training data. Okay. So generically, we can write it as follows. And what we have here is a weighted sum where alpha IY are the weights of your training data vectors. What's the notation here if Let's say this stopped over here. We would have our, let's say, alpha be five-dimensional. So we have alpha one for class Y, alpha two for class Y, alpha three for class Y, alpha four for class Y, alpha five for class Y. This one would be one, this one is zero, this one is zero, this one is zero, this one is negative one. And so if we know the alpha entries, we actually also know the weight vector. We can always go from the alpha entries using this equation over here to the weight vector and the other way around. Because as we learn the weight vector, we could just keep track of how often each training example contributed and with which sign, and that gives us the alpha vectors. And it's, we could just keep track of that instead of keeping track of the weight vector. We can choose. So these are dual representations. You can either keep track of WY or of the alpha vector, and they contain the same information. There will be one of those for each class label, so it'll be another one if you had a second class, another one if you had a third class, and so forth. Note that these entries don't have to be exactly one or negative one. If a training example gets encountered a second time, it results in an update again. It could become plus two or negative two, or it could be set back to zero if you had a plus contribution first and then a negative contribution next. But they will be integers, because you'll always be contributing either plus one or negative one in every step. Okay, so what if we now classify a new example x? We compute the feature vector, compute the inner product with the weight vector wy. We do that for all y and see which one scores the highest. So if we expand this using our alpha vector instead of w, we have this notation over here. We can now just do a little bit of basic math and rearrange this as follows, where we now have a summation which indexes over i. i is old training data, right? We're indexing from i equal one through some number of training data points. Each training data point will have a weight alpha i for class y, and then it'll get multiplied with the inner product of that specific training example fxi with the current feature vector f of x for the example you're trying to test. Okay, if we now rewrite this, this is just new notation for now, but it'll get important later that we have the ability to rewrite this. We write this as kxix. You can just think of k as a similarity measure if you have two data points, you can compute k, x, i, x, which measures the similarity between them. We've already seen some similarity measures when we talked about nearest neighbors. In fact, the inner product was one choice of a similarity measure. That's the one that's happening over here. So what we see now is that we actually never need to build up the weight vectors w. 
we could, in principle, run the perceptron algorithm at all times, just keep track of the alpha entries, and then at test time, we actually never have to rebuild W. We can just use these alpha entries directly and the similarity measure, which in this case would be the inner product of the feature vectors, to compute the score for each label Y. For now, this is just a rearrangement of, of computation. Nothing new has happened, right? It's just a different way of doing the same thing. So what does training of the dual perceptron look like? Dual referring to the fact that we're now keeping track of the alpha vectors rather than the W vectors. We we'll still go through the training examples one by one, and we might have to cycle through the entire training data set multiple times till we're converged. When we try to classify example Xn, for each class, we compute this over here, which is the score. We, sh we see which class maximizes this score. If that corresponds to the label, nothing changes because our weight vectors, now our alpha vectors, are good enough to classify this example. If, on the other hand, it's wrong, the prediction based on this, we update. Originally, we'd update our weight vectors. In this case, we'll update our alpha vector. So the weight vector updates looked like this. Just as a reminder, wy is the weight vector corresponding to the label y that you predict. y star is the label that was provided in the training data set. y star is the correct label. You want a higher score for y star, so you augment the weight vector wy star with f of xn, which will make the inner product between wy star and f of xn higher. And you decrease the inner product between wy and f of xn because you didn't want y to win, so you want to lower its score when it, the score is computed for y for the input xn. In terms of alpha updates, it actually looks a lot simpler. You just keep track. You say, well, the alpha vector is really a set of vectors, one for each class label. Um, the entry n, which is the entry corresponding to the nth training example for the alpha y vector, gets decreased by one, and the nth entry for the alpha y star vector gets increased by one. Any questions about the algorithm? Yes? Actually, I have it to have like this algorithm, but can you just really quickly say again like what exactly alpha is? Okay, so the meaning of alpha, let's say we have a three class classification problem, right? So let's say we have three classes, A, B and C. Let's say we have a five dimensional feature vector. So F of X lives in R5. Then what alpha explicitly would look like, alpha would be, you'd have a alpha A, which is a vector, which would consist of five entries, alpha A, one, alpha A, two, alpha A, three, alpha A, four, alpha A, five, where this five corresponds to, sorry, this, isn't, this was wrong here. Let's, we have five, um, let's find some space, five training examples. And so this will correspond to tracking how much the first training example contributes this is the second training example, third, fourth, and fifth training example. Then there'll be alpha B, which is set up the same way. There'll be alpha B1, alpha B2, alpha B3, alpha B4, alpha B5, and there will be an alpha C, which is set up the same way. Well, it's important to keep in mind that one through five corresponds to training examples one through five. Your feature vector dimensionality doesn't show up here. So you can already start kind of reasoning about, well, when there is a very high dimensional feature vector, this might be nice because you're not explicitly working with the high dimensional feature vector. You are working with a feature, with an alpha vector the size of number of training examples. So if you have a lot of training examples, it might become a little expensive doing it this way. Um, but that's, that's a trade-off here that you're 
Alpha vectors have dimensionality of number of training examples, whereas your original weight vectors have dimensionality of the feature space. Any other questions about the algorithm? So what would like alpha A1, what, what does that represent? Like what is the first, what would like the first entry of the alpha A vector? So as you start the algorithm, each one of those alpha vectors would be initialized all zeros. Then as your first training example comes in, training example one, you check what the scores that you get out, you'd have a tie because it's all zeros, but let's assume, let's assume you classify wrong. You break ties the wrong way, then, and your first training example is of class A, and you classified it as B, then alpha A1 would become plus one to increase the score on that first training example, and then alpha B1 would become negative one to decrease the score on that first training example for class B. And then when the next example comes in, same thing would happen. You check, am I getting the right class label out as a prediction? If so, nothing happens. If not, then these entries get updated by a plus one or a negative one update, depending on, well, whether you were the right class label or the wrong class label. So, so far this is just mechanics, right? So we got the mechanics in place. Now we're going to look at why we might care about this. Okay, so what's interesting here is that what we found is that you can compute the score for a label Y and input X. Originally, in the original perceptron, as a weight vector WY times f of X, but now as a weighted sum of similarity computations. So what we have now we have something like nearest neighbor computations, right? If you get a new example in, what are you doing? You're computing similarity with training examples, and then you're taking a weighted sum of those similarity scores, right? This is weighting those similarity scores. What would happen if we, let's say, degraded this to nearest neighbor? What would nearest neighbor do? Nearest neighbor would say the kernel score is always zero, except for the one closest example, and for the one closest example, the score is one, and the alpha entry would essentially be always be a, a plus for the correct label, a plus one, and a negative one for the incorrect label, and so it would say, well, the correct label, which is the one that's closest, has a plus one score, everything else is a negative one score, and so now, you have, out of this representation, your one nearest neighbor again. If you had k nearest neighbor, same thing would happen. You'd say, all the k, you'd find the k nearest points. Among those k nearest points, you'd then give all of those a similarity measure of one. All the others would have a similarity measure of zero. Again, these entries, the alpha entries would be plus one for the correct class label, negative one for the incorrect class label, and you'd get out essentially majority vote out of this representation. What we have here is something that goes beyond that. Here we don't just look at the one closest or k closest and give those a one and everything else a zero. This similarity measure can be more smooth. It can say, well, I measure similarity and it's somewhat close, less close, and so forth. And all of these examples can contribute in a soft way, contribute more or less depending on how similar they are. And then what's also different is that these Alpha entries, rather than being fixed to plus one or negative one, as what would happen in nearest neighbors, they are learned. You are cycling through your training data, and based on your training data, you are deciding what the right weights are to make this work out. So effectively what you're doing here, you're doing something like a nearest neighbors, but with a soft way of measuring distance rather than a cutoff at the k nearest neighbors, and with an intelligent way of setting these weights based on your training data. For example, if you had a noisy example, if you trained a dual perceptron, it would learn to effectively ignore that noisy example because it would learn weights for the other ones to overrule that, and you'd still get a good label in that region. So, special case of nearest neighbor where you actually can train on your training data, and you can have a more sophisticated way of measuring similarity as you compute your score.
Now, I still ask the question, well, why do we care? Why do we need to do this? Now we know that we can effectively have a perceptron act like a nearest neighbor. Why not just work with the original perceptron? Why work with this dual perceptron, right? So the kernel trick, something that says that you can substitute in pretty much any similarity function in place of the dot product. So rather than thinking about feature vectors and when you're asked to compute KXIX, compute your feature vectors and dot product them, you write a piece of code that is just your similarity function, your kernel function. You pass in two examples and it spits out a number. That's higher when they're more similar, lower when they're less similar. Do some fine print here. Um, don't worry about the fine print too much. If you ever start running into trouble, do start worrying about it, but um, don't worry about it for 188. Essentially, there are some things that have to be true about your similarity measure for these calculations to all work out. In practice, pretty much any reasonable similarity function you pick will satisfy those properties. Okay, so now we can learn new kinds of hypotheses because we're not restricted to first choose a feature vector and then inner product is, on the inner product, then we can just use a kernel function straight up, run the dual perceptron, never worrying about feature vectors, and effectively